Hi everyone and greetings from Bendigo in Central Victoria in Australia. Um, I'm pleased to be able to talk to you today about vocabulary development and early reading success. I'm going to be talking about the what and the why and my colleague Amina McLean is going to be talking about the all important how. So this is um, part one of a two part presentation and of course we'll upload them in such a way that you can access them together. Um, our original intention, of course, was to present these in person this week at the Bendigo Early Language and Literacy Community of Practice meeting in Bendigo, but you all know um, what, how world events have overtaken us on that score, so um, we've reverted to um, online technology. So let's see how we go. Now, in this part of the presentation, what I'd like to do is a um, bit of a brief recap on oral language, on what it is and why it's important in its own right and in relation to the transition to literacy. Um, I'll talk a bit about the relationship between oral language and reading. <coughs> Excuse me, I'll touch on the um, so-called big five or perhaps big six or even big seven, depending on um, how the ground is shifting in this space in relation to reading instruction. I want to introduce um, or review for many of you the simple view of reading and its implications for vocabulary development. Remembering that the simple view of reading is important not only for the decoding part of reading instruction, but it's also important for the language comprehension part and vocabulary, of course, is central to the language comprehension part. Um, and then we'll have a look at vocabulary um, with respect to the what and why. Um, and we'll cover some of the key concepts that you can see listed here. And I'd also like to flag what I think are some potentially useful resources. I will mention now, because I don't think I've got this covered in the slide presentation, that on the Bellcop homepage on my blog, The Snow Report, there is um, a list of what I think are useful resources in relation to reading instruction more generally, not just vocabulary and reading comprehension. I probably need to update that, um, but you will find resources there. So if you go to The Snow Report and then to the Bellcop homepage. Okay, so what do we mean by oral language? Well, Amina and I are both speech pathologists. So, of course, um, we hone in on the fact that oral language is all about everyday talking or expressive language skills and everyday listening or receptive or comprehension skills. And importantly, the mental representations that sit behind them. So there's a couple of important um, points here. Firstly, this is a two channel process. So we're not just interested in and concerned about um, children's ability to express themselves. We're also uh, equally interested in their ability to take in, understand, process, make sense of language used by others. In a general sense, I would say it's easier to make um, even a rough assessment of a child's expressive language skills by um, having a conversation with them, listening to them talk. It's probably a little bit harder to make an accurate assessment though, of their comprehension skills um, because all of us, one way or another, from a young age are socialised to um, pretend, behave as if we understand something that we don't understand or we learn how to pick up environmental cues. And it can be surprising sometimes for teachers when a child undergoes a formal speech pathology assessment and language comprehension is assessed formally and it can sometimes be found to be much more wanting than everyday um, observations might suggest. So the other important part here is that language is a representational system. So it represents mental concepts such as memories, ideas, opinions, um, wants, needs. If it wasn't a representational system, it would simply be a form of artificial intelligence. It would be um, effectively Siri. Language consists of a number of um, layers. It's got the sound system or the phonological system, which of course is the first thing that um, babies can um, produce and they do all of these things in a highly communicative way. Um, and then uh, in early um, infancy, moving into toddlerhood, we start to see the emergence of words and word parts. Uh, moving into phrases that ultimately become sentences and then connected talk, connected discourse. And there are various different kinds of connected discourse that you can see listed here. 
Um, I don't want to suggest that this development is completely linear because of course it isn't. Just because conversation, for example, is down the bottom of that list doesn't mean that you can't have a two-way, a meaningful um, two-way conversation in inverted commas with a um, six or eight month old baby because we all know that we can the serve and return this turn taking anticipation and responses so there's a lot of layers to language they're all important and they are all interconnected I love this quote uh, from McEwen just last year. I think it probably uh, sums up what we uh, kind of already knew, but it's nice to have it expressed for us so simply and eloquently that language is a dynamic human creation and thus inherently a bit of a mess. It's a bit disappointing, but it is inherently a bit of a mess because it's something that humans created. So it's a wonderful mess. It's a lovely mess, an intriguing mess. Um, and that's just oral language that says nothing about the complexity um, and apparent inconsistencies of written language that derive from the fact that in English we've borrowed words from so many different um, languages and cultures through uh, historical factors such as trade and war and um, patterns of immigration. Um, many of you would be familiar with the notion of the five big ideas in early reading instruction, and they're the first five listed on this slide, and they came out of the US National Reading Panel report in 2000, so it's amazing to think that that's actually 20 years ago. Um, in South Australia, here in Australia, um, our colleagues have added oracy to that list, and they refer to the big six. And I think there's a good argument that we should be um, including morphology in this list of big ideas in relation to reading instruction. And I'll come back to the reasons for that a little bit later on. Honestly, I've got in brackets there because I'm not actually convinced that it sits alongside the other um, big ideas at the same level. And for me, this metaphor works quite nicely for us to think of these um, ideas, these domains, as being as interdependent as the fingers on our hand. And for me, oracy is effectively the, the connecting factor um, because phonemic awareness is um, an aspect of oral language, phonics and morphology are an aspect of oral language, obviously vocabulary and so on. So for, for me, oracy is the unifying factor rather than something that sits at the same level as those other um, developmental domains of language that relate to early literacy. But the important thing here is the interdependence. So what do we know? What are some key principles regarding the nexus between oral language and literacy? Well, it is important to remember that oral language skills are acquired naturally. So we think of them as being biologically primary, um, where reading needs to be taught. It's something that's biologically secondary. That's a really important distinction. And I think if we can keep that distinction front of mind, it helps to remind us of um, what needs to be happening in early years classrooms. Um, particularly in the first three years of formal reading instruction. We know that on their own, oral language skills don't turn a good talker into a good reader. So oral language skills are incredibly important and the stronger a child's oral language skills on school entry, the better, but they're not magic. They don't turn a child who has good verbal skills into a child who can pick up a book and read it or who can pick up a pen and paper and write. Um, strong oral language experiences therefore support, but they don't replace early reading instruction. It's important too to think about the fact that learning to read is fundamentally a linguistic task. It's a language based task. But reading is something that we as humans have only been doing for a relatively recent um, period of time. We think it's somewhere, the estimates vary, it's somewhere around five to 6,000 years. Now, that, that tells us that um, that's very recent. Um, reading um, and writing systems were created by humans as a contrivance 
because they had a cultural value, um, a value for commerce and a value for laws, for things that had to be written down and shared horizontally with contemporaries and then could also then be um, transmitted um, vertically to subsequent generations. But it is just a human contrivance. It's just a symbol system that happens to be um, highly valued. As I've already said, it's not natural, it's biologically secondary. And we know that some approaches to early reading instruction are associated with greater success for all children than are others. And in this way, we might like to think about oral language skills being the engine and high quality instruction being the fuel, recognising though that sometimes engines need um, to be made more powerful, um, but all engines uh, work better when they are exposed to high quality fuel. Um, I spend a lot of time as a someone who's a speech pathologist um, by background and um, also a psychologist um, focusing on and talking about the importance of oral language abilities for the transition to reading in the first three years of school. Um, and that's important. However, I would like to emphasise that there's actually um, a bi-directional relationship here that we need to think about. We need to think not only about the influence and importance of oral language abilities for early reading, but we also need to think about what early reading does for oral language, the positive feedback loop that occurs there when we have children being exposed to new vocabulary for the first time through their own reading. So they're exposed to new vocabulary, higher order, um, less frequent vocabulary. They're also exposed to longer, more complex sentence structures. Writers know that readers can slow down and reread um, many times what they've read. When we talk to each other, we typically reduce the complexity and the length of our sentences because we take into account the other person's information processing abilities. But that's, that's not a, um, a constraint that writers have to be overly mindful of. So it's magical for parents when they um, see and hear children using new words in everyday conversations that they haven't actually um, been taught or been exposed to verbally, but they're words that they have um, only encountered through their own reading. And I often say that the big clue to this occurring is the fact that um, children drop these words into the conversation and mispronounce them because um, they, they don't know, um, uh, particularly if it's a polysyllabic word, um, that they don't know where the emphasis goes. So they put the emphasis on the wrong syllable. There you go. Many of you would be familiar, I'm sure, with the notion of the Matthew effect in learning to read. This is a biblical reference introduced, I'm pretty sure, into the reading literature by Keith Stanovich back in the 1980s. And he was referring here to the notion um, that's referred to in the New Testament that the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. So children who enter school with well-developed foundational oral language skills are ready, particularly if they're exposed to high quality instruction, to take off and achieve very well in the early reading space. Children without such foundational skills, though, struggle and, um, as represented here, typically flatline and are really struggling by grade three. And what you'll notice here is that there's a relatively narrow deficit to start off with and that opens up um, very quickly. And that's something that we're wanting to prevent as much as we possibly can um, when we consider reading instruction um, in, in relation to how we go about um, approaching that all important task with respect to um, both sides of the simple view of reading that I'll get to in a moment. Um, okay, and here we are, the simple view of reading. Now, the simple view of reading, as you can see here, was published by Goff and Tunma back in 1986. And if ever there was an idea that chose a bad time in history to make its grand entrance, unfortunately, I'd have to say it was this one because 1986 was um, peak whole language, certainly in Australia um, and probably in other first world industrialised um, English speaking nations such as the US, Canada, the UK and New Zealand. 
And I think it's really unfortunate that the simple view of reading did not seem to find its way through the knowledge translation pipeline to the hands of pre-service teachers and hence into classrooms. And um, it wasn't able to um, have the influence on teachers thinking and understanding about the, uh, what the reading task is. I think we all agree, irrespective of our ideological stance on reading instruction though, that the purpose of reading is reading comprehension, represented here as RC. And what the simple view of reading tells us is that reading comprehension is the product of a child's ability to decode text, to understand uh, the fact that the squiggles on the page, uh, the, the letters, the graphemes represent speech sounds, phonemes. So decoding multiplied by language comprehension. And it is critical that that's a multiplication sign in the middle of this equation, not an addition sign, because as you know, anything multiplied by zero is in fact zero. So a child cannot afford to have weak skills on either side of this equation. Um, another way of representing the simple view of reading, I, I do love a metaphor um, and uh, I first encountered this metaphor of the treasure chest um, courtesy of Alison Clark, but she tells me that she encountered it courtesy of Maria Murray and Maria Murray might be, know even more about its ancestry or she might be the clever person who came up with it. But this metaphor invites us to think about a treasure chest where the meaning of the text is locked inside the chest and the child, in order to get to the meaning of the text, has to unlock two, key, two um, locks. They need a key to the decoding lock. They need a key to the language comprehension lock. You all know enough about um, this kind of uh, chest to know what it looks like if you manage to get a lock open on one side. You can have a bit of a peek in, but it's not very satisfactory. And you certainly can't rummage around and pull stuff out in any kind of satisfying way. Now, the simple view of reading also provides us with this two by two matrix in which to classify children according to their skill profiles. So very, very simply, if we put language comprehension on the X axis and decoding ability on the Y axis, you can see that we can look very broadly at four groups of children. We really want all children to be up in the top right hand quadrant that we want them to be good at word recognition or decoding and good at language comprehension. Um, you can see there that there are different um, categories of children according to their skill profiles and unfortunately there's a significant group of children who are in the bottom left hand corner who have um, areas of weakness with respect to both their decoding abilities and their language comprehension abilities and that's a pattern that can persist well into secondary school. There are different, more recent ways of representing the simple view of reading. This is the Cognitive Foundations Framework, which is really just a more elaborate, more detailed representation of the simple view of reading. Um, and um, I'm happy if you can't uh, um, source that paper, we can provide that to you. But you can see that this um, model or this diagram has more detail about the component skills that sit underneath both word recognition and language comprehension. So it unpacks um, from the perspective of the teacher, what are the domains that need to be addressed in the early years context. And again, another way of looking at exactly the same concept, um, and you can see a, a URL down the bottom of this slide that will take you to an open access document um, that contains this figure and um, a lot of explanation around it. There's no shortage of information available um, in open access format about the simple view of reading. Many of you would be familiar too with the Hollis Scarborough reading rope. Um, now, the, the reading rope, I think, is a, a lovely metaphor because it invites us to consider the individual skill domains in both the language comprehension um, part of early reading and the decoding part of early reading from the perspective of the novice. And you'll notice here that on the left-hand side of the slide, 
um, you can see some of, again, those core underlying um, skill areas that need to be a focus in early years reading instruction. And you can see that they are represented in the rope by individual strands. And I guess it would be fair to say that uh, for individual children, some of those strands might be longer um, than others because they might have uh, more literacy knowledge. They may have bigger vocabularies. Um, but the important thing is from the perspective of the novice, the child who is commencing formal reading instruction, that these skills are not necessarily well connected to each other. They're not working uh, necessarily synergistically um, on that um, target skill of understanding written text. Um, as the, as the child moves through the early um, reading instruction process, you can see that the strands do become uh, interconnected with each other. And over time, they become closely connected such that the decoding part of um, reading becomes really indiscernible from the language comprehension part for successful readers. Um, and this, of course, um, corresponds to gains in fluency. So we see reading comprehension becoming more strategic um, and less effortful over time and decoding also becoming more automatic over time as children have more and more words stored in their orthographic memory um, so that um, they're, they're not having to decode through the word for every word that they encounter because that word is already stored. It's been encountered a sufficient number of times for it to be stored. Um, so again, you'll find many representations of the um, Scarborough Reading Rope if you punch that into a Google search. So vocabulary is obviously an integral part of these models. And it's important to think, uh, to have a brief look at where it comes from and why it's important. Before I do that though, I just want to introduce this notion of vocabulary tiers because I'm going to talk quite a bit about particularly tier one and tier two vocabulary. So this is a conceptual framework proposed by Beck and colleagues um, and written about in 2013. And they propose that tier one words are the most basic words. They're learnt um, by children through everyday oral conversations and experiences. You can see some examples listed there. Um, they learn them through repetition in context, primarily in conversations with other adults, but of course in conversations with peers as well. Children from non-English speaking backgrounds or those with neurodisabilities may actually need some explicit instruction to support tier one. And this accounts for about 8,000 word families, not words, but word families. Tier two refers to common high frequency words that are used across a range of domains by mature language users. So they're common words in everyday use by adults. They're important for reading comprehension. Many of them have multiple meanings and we'll come back to that um, shortly. And they have a strong overlap with general academic language. And children typically receive less exposure. They're, they're, there's less repetition of these words in everyday life. So in many cases, teachers are going to need to not take for granted tier words as the tier two words as not all children will have acquired them naturally. Here we're looking at about 7,000 word families. We're not going to talk, um, or, well, I'm not going to talk um, much today at all about tier three um, vocabulary. If Amina and I had had more time to confer before we um, put these presentations together, I'd know how much she's going to cover in her presentation, but um, you'll have to discover that when you listen to it. But here we're talking about um, subject specific vocabulary that needs to be taught. For example, um, vocabulary that's specific to the biology curriculum or to the geography curriculum. Now, if I was working with you face to face, this is a question that I would pose to you. Um, and um, typically what I find is that audiences have a bit of a think about this and I tell them that they've got to come up with one preferred response to this question. 
and most people are pretty happy to land on the idea that preschool vocabulary growth comes predominantly from conversations with adults. That's not to say um, that those other um, avenues of exposure aren't important, but it's predominantly conversations with adults. However, when I ask the same question in relation to school age children, I find that I get a very wide representation of views and people are not so sure about their responses. Often people think um, it's in fact conversations with peers. But um, importantly, what we want to have happening um, in school age children is that uh, children are being exposed to most of their new vocabulary through their own reading. So that really emphasises and reinforces the importance of them being on track with reading by the time they get to middle primary school years where teachers are taking their foot off the reading instruction pedal um, and putting it on. So we're shifting from uh, learning to read to reading to learn. And of course, we know that if children are not on track by the mid-primary school years, if they're not um, being exposed to new vocabulary and longer, more complex, intricate sentence structures through their own reading, then in many cases they're in trouble because reading is not seen then as an intrinsically rewarding worthwhile activity and um, those children become reluctant um, readers and it's not unusual then to see secondary um, mental health issues of, of both um, internalising and externalising mental health problems start to emerge. Now, the numbers per se on this graph are not what's important. What's important is the, the slope of the growth that needs to be occurring in um, vocabulary comprehension between years two and years five in order for children to be keeping up academically. So you can see that um, you, know, you can get by with um, a, a understanding um, a relatively modest number of words in year two, but uh, that's increased um, in enormously, the requirements have increased enormously by year five, just to navigate through the academic curriculum. So um, in the preschool years, we know that oral language um, vocabulary comes mainly from um, interactions predominantly with adults. We know that context is critical. We know that scaffolding from adults is really important. We want adults to be monitoring children's comprehension and to be explaining, rewording, paraphrasing, demonstrating. We want there to be lots of repetition and this is how we're building the store of tier one words and also some early exposure to tier two words. In the school years, um, as I said, vocab expansion is highly reliant on children's own reading. Um, we simply can't put into everyday conversations enough opportunities for tier two vocabulary development. We'd sound a bit strange and a bit pompous, to be honest, if we were talking to children using all tier two vocabulary every day. And as I've said, tier three um, vocab is subject specific. Um, writers convey meaning through words, that's um, perhaps self-evident. However, what isn't perhaps self-evident is the fact that unless the writer is writing a textbook, it's not their job to explain what words mean. It's actually the reader's job to work out what words mean. Sometimes that can be done through inferencing, but that's not necessarily 100% reliable, even for adults. Um, so in many cases, children are going to need to refer to another source such as a dictionary and then go back and read the sentence again, look at the word in the dictionary and um, see whether the meaning that they found in the dictionary actually aligns to the text in the book. Um, children who are not reading are not being exposed to tier two vocabulary and then we see that Matthew effect again, the idea of the rich getting richer and the poor getting poorer. So why is vocabulary growth important? It's important because it's the vector, the carrier for mental representations, for ideas, concepts, facts, memories. Remembering that vocabulary isn't just a store of nouns. Vocabulary um, exists across all parts of speech, nouns, verbs, adjectives, um, the, the whole uh, adverbs, the whole box and dice. 
Um, a stronger, stronger vocabulary development promotes the ability to engage in oral conversations of greater complexity and subtlety. Um, it enhances the child's use and understanding of shades of meaning in conversations and in reading. Um, and that becomes increasingly important in reading. Um, and it therefore increases the likelihood that their child, if we go back to that simple view of reading and the language comprehension part of that formula, having a strong vocabulary increases the likelihood that the written text, once decoded, is actually going to be understood and that reading is going to be seen as a worthwhile activity. The big picture is that it promotes academic achievement and better vocational and life outcomes. However, and this is an important however, um, there's a notion um, of a lexical bar that needs to be crossed for academic success. And the lexical bar is the divide between spoken and written language. This is a concept that was written about um, back in the 1980s by um, an Australian academic by the name of David Corson. And I've reproduced here a few quotes out of his book, book because I think they're really worth our while giving some deep consideration to in relation to um, language and vocabulary. He said, we all know that children's differences in language ability more than any other observable factor affect their potential for success in schooling. It's clear that achievement in schools is highly dependent on the child's ability to display knowledge. This display often takes the form of spoken or written language. Since all forms of knowledge are filtered through language, the chief item of knowledge in any culture is its language. And finally, language theorists in education have often overlooked the fact that experienced classroom teachers tacitly acknowledge in their daily practice that it is the different ways children can and want to use words in schooling, which is the measure of their language ability and the measure of much of their success potential in education. So I think these are quite profound um, ideas that, um, again, you know, I think perhaps haven't quite seen as much light in um, the last three decades um, since they were um, published, but I think they're just as relevant and pertinent to us today in 2020 as they were in 1985. So what does it mean for children to cross the lexical bar, to be able to shift between oral language requirements to written language requirements? Um, really, this um, mastery of the meaning system begins with vocabulary, which is our store of words. And um, having more um, words corresponds also with background knowledge, because we need to think here, and I think this was a, um, a distinction made by E.D. Hirsch, I may be wrong, that children need to have word knowledge as well as world knowledge. And when we're building one, we're typically building the other. So more background knowledge um, that children can bring to conversations and later to reading and academic engagement, the more likely they are to be understanding the material that they're encountering. Um, vocabulary size promotes understanding of shades of meaning and shades of understanding, uh, remembering that in English, uh, we have a rich vocabulary in which we like to turn the dial just one degree with respect to meaning. So we differentiate between annoyance and frustration and irritation, for example, um, that all mean something similar, but they don't mean exactly the same thing. Um, the semantic and syntactic systems link through our knowledge of different parts of speech. So as I've already said, vocabulary development isn't just about nouns, far from it. It's, for, it's about um, every part of speech and also increasing mastery of the syntactic system. Children need repeated exposure to acquire new tier one words and more intentional instruction um, increasingly at tiers two and tier three. And we know, of course, that vocabulary is a strong predictor of reading success on school entry. It's one of a number of strong predictors. Um, as I said, English contains more words than many of the world's other languages because of its rich and complex history. Um, we've got more than a million words with about 170,000 in use. Most adult native speakers of English have a vocab of somewhere between 20 and 35,000 words. Um, and you can see there that on school entry, most children know around 
2,000 words by year seven, they need to understand around 50,000 words. And of course, we know that receptive vocabulary tends to be larger than expressive, particularly in the early years. So um, let's go back to our conceptual framework that I mentioned a moment ago about tiers of vocabulary that I've already introduced. Um, and here's a little exercise for you to see whether you can pick out what you think are the likely tier two words. So the Jacobs family had not had a holiday for three years, so this trip was eagerly anticipated. Everyone had their bags packed, but the process of getting all the gear into the back of the car wasn't straightforward. Dan was insistent that his surfboard had to come with them, much to Melissa's annoyance. Things were getting testy when Dan had the inspired idea that they could connect a small trailer to the car. This would enable them to include everyone's gear and avert a family crisis. Now, I'm sure you've identified what you think are a number of tier two words in that passage, and they're the ones that I would say are the tier two words. So these are words that children might not necessarily have encountered, um, or in some cases at all, through their oral conversations with adults in their world, or they may not have encountered them sufficient, a sufficient number of times uh, with sufficiently salient contextual cues for them to have consolidated that word in their lexicon. Um, Beck and colleagues, and now I'm not sure how to pronounce this, is it Nagy? I'll, I'll, I'll go with Nagy. It could be Nagy, it could be a number of things. And Scott um, proposed different levels of knowledge of a word that you can see listed here from level one, never having heard it before, down to level four, knowing a word well, being able to define it, and knowing when it's misused. So, Let's have a look at some um, words. And again, if I was working with you face to face, this is always a fun activity to get people to do in pairs, to pick a number um, and then have to have a think about their knowledge of the word, um, whether it's a word that they've never heard before, whether it's a word that they might have a general sense of uh, its meaning, but not be able to be specific about it. So knowing, for example, that sycophantic is not a good thing to be called, but not knowing um, why, because not having a deeper knowledge of the word. Um, sometimes uh, people can say, well, I know it's something to do with, um, with plants or with botany, um, but, and by the way, sycophantic is nothing to do with plants or botany. There's a separate um, examples, but then they can't go any further. And then finally, level four is knowing the word well, being able to define it, use it appropriately, and importantly, know when it's misused. My favourite um, misused word is one that I hear in the media from time to time, and I'm sure you do too. Too, and that's the word fulsome, F-U-L-S-O-M-E. Um, you sometimes hear politicians saying that they're going to give a fulsome explanation or a fulsome apology. Now, some of you may know that that is a completely um, inappropriate and inadvertent use of that word. If you don't, uh, if you don't know the actual meaning of fulsome, look it up, and you'll see why I'm always a bit bemused when I hear politicians use it so emphatically in that context. Now, there are some things that students need to learn about um, words and how words work. And one of these is the fact that many words um, work a bit harder than other words because they are polysemous. Um, so when, um, when uh, polysemy applies, so poly meaning many, and I'm guessing here that the root sem comes from the same derivation as semantic, um, which is the word we use in relation to the meaning system. So uh, my guess here is that we're looking at a word that means many meanings, it certainly works. Um, when we're looking at polysemous words, we're looking at words where the spelling doesn't change, but the meaning does. So, for example, if you, um, if someone met your father and said to you, oh, I met your dad last week, he's a funny guy, isn't he? Um, or you might have reason to think that uh, your dad could be described as funny for a number of reasons, and you might say, do you mean funny, ha-ha, or funny, a bit weird? Um, and you can see other examples that are listed there. This is just a ridiculously small number of examples, but the important point here, and, and other, other examples of polysemous words are words like bat, 
um, as in bat and bull versus um, bat, the thing that um, flies through the air, um, crane, which can be a piece of building equipment or it can be a bird with a long neck. You might be able to see some reasons there why the piece of building equipment was um, so named. Um, but the important thing is that if you're a child who has the meaning of a polysemous word stored in only one way, in one dimension, then that word is going to be confusing to you if you encounter it in wearing one of its other jackets in another context where it's behaving quite differently from the way that you're used to seeing that word behave. So I don't know what proportion of words in the English language can be described as polysemous, but, uh, but we know that it's a lot of them. So the important thing here is spelling doesn't change, but meaning does. Um, then we have words that are homophones, words that sound the same but are written differently, and they um, typically have completely different meanings. Um, you'd all be familiar with uh, the way that you comfort a grammar nerd, there, there, there. Um, and probably like me, you, you're uh, frustrated on an almost daily basis by misuse of some of these words. Um, principle and principle uh, seems to throw a lot of people. Um, I spent time earlier this week with some first year students emphasising that when they're citing a reference, that's uh, actually a word that they may never have seen before. It begins with a C. It's got nothing to do with a building site and it's got nothing to do with their eyes. Um, so these can be quite confusing to um, readers who uh, don't have well-developed vocabularies and uh, are not necessarily exposed to the lower frequency um, versions of homophones. And then there are words that um, look the same in print, but are pronounced differently. And these, of course, are homographs. Some of these are um, different parts of speech, such as convict, um, which is a noun, and convict, which is a verb. Um, some of them uh, uh, um, Now I've lost my train of thought. Um, and some of them are um, nouns, some of them are verbs. That's, that's probably the, um, the key message here when it comes to um, homographs. Although that's not necessarily the case um, because um, there, there can be, there are other examples of homographs that look the same in print but are pronounced differently. It's useful here to know about stress in words. Um, and to know about schwa vowels. And I'm um, often struck when I talk to audiences of teachers that knowledge of schwa vowels is not, um, not widespread. Um, but the schwa vowel, of course, is the unstressed vowel in a word with more than one syllable. And the example I often use here um, is my name, um, Pamela. It's got three syllables. The middle syllable is the unstressed one, so it's got an uh sound. And it is useful for teachers to know about schwa vowels in teaching reading and in teaching spelling. And it's useful to explicitly teach children about schwa vowels. Um, now that leads me on to morphology, which as I said earlier, I think should be listed as one of the big ideas. I think morphology has been somewhat neglected um, in relation to early reading instruction. And I think um, morphological principles can be brought in quite early in the reading instruction process because we're introducing words um, that have an S on the end, whether a plural S or an inflectional verb S. Um, children are ex being exposed to ED endings and ING endings quite early in the reading process. But I'm getting ahead of myself here. What do we mean by uh, morphology? Well, English it structurally is a morphophonemic language. It's not a strictly alphabetic language. When we're talking about morphology, we're talking about um, what's going on at a sublexical level, below the level of the word. Um, and apologies for the typo in that um, slide. I think there's been a bit of strange um, editing there. So um, I'll just keep moving on that. Um, morphology relates closely to etymology, which is the study of word origins. It's helpful in helping children to um, identify word families. Oh, sorry, this slide has really gone a bit strange. 
Um, uh, I can see what's happened. The font from um, up here has migrated and it used to be down here. So I'm sorry about that. Um, yeah, morphology relates to phonology, phonemic awareness, phoneme, grapheme, correspondence and phonics knowledge is relevant to children moving into the morphology space. So when we're looking at morphology, we're looking at the study of the smallest units of meaning within a word. So words have roots and can have affixes, um, such as prefixes and suffixes. The, uh, the root of a word can be bound or unbound. And I'm sorry, that's another formatting error that's occurred in this slide. That should be on the next line. Um, in fact, I can probably edit this in real time. There we go. Um, when we see something like uh, in, in a child's writing, I watched the footy uh, written with a T rather than an ED, we can ask ourselves, well, what's this child's writing telling us? Um, it's telling us that they can correctly hear the final sound in this word, the, the T sound, because it's following a voiceless um, uh, comf uh, consonant here at the end that the chut sound is um, a voiceless affricate um, so we're getting a chut sound at the end because of co-articulation but what that child hasn't learned is the orthographic convention of representing the past tense with an ed so let's hope there's no more funny um, formatting issues in subsequent slides um, here's an example of uh, working through um, the, the, some morphological analysis with the word shape. So that's the base word, the smallest unit of meaning. We can't take anything away from that and still be left with a word. But you can see we can add an S that could be either plural or a verb form. We can add ing, but then we've got a spelling convention to work with here that we take away the E um, to make it the present progressive shaping. We can put ed on the end, we can put re on the start. Some interesting things happen with words that begin with s if we put the prefix miss on the front. Um, here we've got some protection for a child who knows something about morphology. They've got, they're protected against the possibility of pronouncing this word as mishape, which is um, an entirely understandable um, initial um, go at that word. Um, but if they know that M-I-S, miss is a prefix, then that helps them to have another hypothesis about what that word might be. And it also, of course, helps with the spelling of the word. Um, and you can see that we can add um, prefixes and suffixes. So morphology is the study of um, the, the smallest units of meaning in a word and how, um, and how they work together. There are a number of common affixes in English that you can see listed here, probably the most common um, prefixes and suffixes. That's by no means an exhaustive list of either, but they're the most commonly occurring ones. So why, if we're interested in building vocabulary and reading comprehension, would we increase the focus on morphology? Well, we would do that because the structure of English is morphophonemic. It's not strictly alphabetic. It's, uh, we do it because morphology gives us a bridge between the sound structure of words and their meaning. Morphology ties to etymology, the study of word origins, which helps uh, us to identify word families and patterns in words and between words. It's highly beneficial to the learning of spelling rules and it's beneficial to both typically developing and struggling readers. This is not some good china to keep in the back room and just bring out for the more advanced learners. It's a, an important body of knowledge to provide to all children, um, regardless of where they sit um, in the, on the reading achievement um, ladder. Um, and of course, it enriches a student's knowledge about the English language. And Louisa Moat said back in 2010 that good readers attend to the internal parts of words, 
both spoken and written, they use strategies to distinguish and remember the meanings of words that sound alike, including recognising meaningful parts. So you can see how this really ties very closely to building vocabulary when children can see links between words at a morphological level and also at an etymologi etymological level. As you can see here, there's some common roots. And again, if I was working with you face to face today, I'd give you some time time to um, perhaps talk to your partner about what you think these roots um, might mean and also come up with some words that are derived from them. So we'll um, cut straight to the chase here. Um, many of those would be familiar to you, I think. Um, in, in, in fact, uh, for many of you, all of them will be um, familiar. Um, a fun fact that a lot of people aren't aware of is the fact that the city Philadelphia in the United States um, comes from this um, idea of affinity. Um, Philadelphia actually means love of one's brother, uh, philos and adelphos. Um, okay, so that's uh, a little bit about etymology and morphology. So just quickly, what are some guiding principles then around tier two vocabulary instruction in the school years? It's important to think about vocab development in and knowledge in two dimensions. There's the breadth dimension, the number of words that a student has mastered at different vocab tiers, receptively and expressively or generatively, and also the depth. And you, if you think back to the slide um, a few minutes ago where we had four levels of knowledge about a word. So here we're thinking about um, the, the child's knowledge of a word at a definition level, but also their ability to deal with different shades of meaning, to handle polysemy, to deal with figurative and idiomatic use of language, which is something that um, I haven't really touched on in this presentation, but many of the ways in which we use language in everyday life have a, a significant discrepancy between literal meaning and non-literal meaning. Jokes, puns, sarcasm are all examples of um, linguistic devices where there's a significant distance between literal meaning and non-literal meaning. And of course, contextual factors are important there as well. Um, and then we think about levels of vocabulary knowledge. So what is it that you're wanting the, uh, a student to know? Are you wanting them to recognise the word? Well, of course you want them to recognise the word because we want that to be um, quite automatic, particularly um, for tier one and tier two words. Uh, but that's important too um, at tier three when we're looking at um, particular areas of the academic curriculum. Um, children need to um, have um, acquired to the point of automaticity words such as enzyme, for example, in the biology curriculum or peninsula in the geography um, uh, curriculum. Uh, we want them to understand multiple meanings and you can see some examples listed down at the bottom of the slide there. We want them to understand the word while they're reading a text. Um, uh, moving into higher levels, we might want them to use the word when they're speaking. We want, might want them to use the word in different contexts um, and to use the word in writing. So here we're looking at gaining an increasingly deep knowledge of vocabulary. Tier two vocab development is um, challenging and potentially a bit daunting in some ways, partly because there's just so many words and teachers often say, well, where do I start? Um, the polysemous nature of many words means that students can have trouble shifting between meanings in different contexts. So a specific focus on and um, understanding of polysemy and having the notion of polysemy front of mind in classroom instruction can be quite valuable and, and recognising that uh, you might be shifting easily between two or three different meanings of a word, but the child may only have one meaning of that word stored, which is what's causing the roadblock in their comprehension of that piece of text. Uh, remembering, as we've already said, that it's not the writer's job to explain a word's meaning unless they're writing a textbook. It's a reader's job to either know it or work it out. Um, there are fewer repetitions at uh, Tier 2 than there are of Tier 1 
And of course, knowledge of a word goes well beyond its definition, which is partly related to polysemy, but it's also um, related to the fact that um, context can change the way a word um, should be interpreted. I'm not going to spend a lot of time going through um, the things that are listed here. For many of you, this, this will be familiar territory and revision, but we know that in the early years, the preschool years, um, there are a range of factors that are, are profitable with respect to early language development. And the most important thing, of course, is children being spoken to a lot, spoken with a lot um, by adults. By um, it, It's important that adults are child-led, that children are experiencing a lot of serve and return, rich linguistic engagement opportunities. Um, and of course, that takes in books, it takes in songs, it takes in rhyme um, and ideally um, in optimal circumstances takes in trips to museums and zoos and uh, rich opportunities to gain word knowledge as well as world knowledge. Fundamentally though we need to have high expectations of and for all children in the preschool years just as we're going to do again in the, um, the school years. In the school years though, we need to be more intentional about vocabulary development. Um, we need to keep vocabulary front of mind in all classroom activities, remembering that children um, have different starting points. So that we, we know there's abundant evidence to indicate that children don't start primary or secondary school at the same point with respect to their language abilities. So we need to be really keeping our foot on the pedal when it comes to developing vocabulary providing explicit teaching, providing a wide variety of texts, lots of opportunities for consolidation, practice, repetition, and um, mastery, using meta language in the secondary years, talking about language. It helps incredibly uh, for teachers to be as knowledgeable as they can, to have an explicit knowledge of how uh, language works, not just an implicit knowledge. Um, and again, the same factors apply at secondary level as do at primary level. There's a couple of tools that uh, you can access. Um, I'm pretty sure these are um, accessible online, but again, feel free to contact me if you can't find them. But these are tools to uh, really promote um, audits really of classroom activity with respect to oral language development, including vocabulary. Um, I, I think Amina and I would both strongly endorse this book, Bringing Words to Life, by Isabel Beck and her colleagues. And if you're only going to buy one book about vocabulary, I'd certainly suggest that you make it this one. There's some additional um, resource material listed on this slide. And um, not necessarily specifically about vocabulary, but I do like um, this Daniel Willingham YouTube clip that goes for about 10 minutes, um, which is about teaching content. So that's really going to that idea of um, world knowledge as well as word knowledge. Um, so that's how you can uh, get in touch with me. Um, I hope that this quick whiz around vocabulary um, from a uh, what and why perspective has been um, a useful foundation for what I know is going to be a fabulous presentation that Amina gives next about the how of vocabulary development. So thank you for listening, everyone, and I look forward to uh, perhaps uh, engaging with you again, um, ideally face-to-face, -face, um, but certainly in the online uh, platform.